welcome to the Narrow Path Live and in Color. Glad to have you today. And um, gosh, I've just been so enjoying getting into the book of John with you through this uh, devotional segment, trying to bring a little extra for sure. But um, today I want to talk, I want to get right into, we, we, we finished with our wonderful story about uh, the woman called in adultery in Genesis, in um, John 8, 1 through 11. We finished that uh, a couple days ago. And today we're just going to spend verses, uh, chapter 8, verses 12 through, I think we'll finish through uh, verse 30. And just want to talk about what I think really is just, really more just kind of having a conversation um, around things that just really have to do with I guess if I was to give it a title, I would call it the real theologian in the room. There's obviously this banter, this back and forth between Jesus and the religious leaders throughout John. That's where John wants us to understand what's going on. Um, And obviously we know who that real theologian in the room is who came to teach the class with uh, participants who um, don't like the class and the material that's being taught and would like to get rid of the teacher. But uh, the real theologian in the room is, I think, the focus of these verses that I want to talk about a little bit today. And and it's especially important now. We just got some news. Um, Just yesterday or the day before, my wife's been keeping up with it pretty well about a, a local theologian, pastor, uh, in the world's room um, that many people flocked to and uh, were enamored with him. And uh, evidently, he was a charlatan, a wolf in sheep's clothing, which is now being found out, a lot of protests going on, things, etc. And uh, so I guess my focus, and I'll, and I'll close with this too, is as we get into this passage, is, is the fact that um, it's really important who you're listening to. Even guys like me, if I'm telling you something that's contrary to this book, you should not be listening. And when I say contrary to this book, that sounds like just an open, shut case. It's really more complicated than that. Um, You know, it it requires someone to take the Word of God seriously, first and foremost, but also to, to look at the Word of God in its total, to really sift through it and understand what God is saying in a variety of different ways and the things that he's saying very clearly coming down on the things that are the most important to us, which Jesus is going to talk about. But it's really, really important who you're listening to. Don't, don't, don't short skirt. Don't, 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 um, don't take the, um, the easy path to finding someone you would listen to, including me. If you think I'm, I'm not saying something that's that's true, um, you have a reason to, to comment about it, question me about it, or better yet, find a, another place to to listen to somebody. And that requ- and that that applies to your church too. Right now, today, the preaching and teaching of the Word of God, the preaching and teaching of the Word of God, sounds old school. It's like the most important thing. It's the most important thing the church can be about right now because it has fallen on very, very, very hard times. And, of course, Jesus told us it would be this way. He told us there would be wolves in sheep's clothing. He told us that there would be a falling away of the church. We're witnessing it even now. Don't get me wrong. In many places of the globe, the church is flourishing and thriving. And in many places like the West, although there's there's pockets and signs, um, It's a hot mess out there. So it's important who you're listening to. So enough of that. You've heard that already, correct? So Jesus is still at the Feast of Booths. We're here in um, verse 12. And basically they're continuing. Jesus and the religious leaders are kind of continuing the dispute they had back in chapter 5, verse 31 to 37, about his being the light sent from the Father and uh, his... uh, his comparison to John the Baptist, et cetera. So kind of a pickup of the same conversation. You know, they like to they like to pick their uh, their particular freak flag and, and stick with it. But Jesus again spoke to them, and of course the Feast of Tabernacles or, or Booths is, is is has a lot to do with, with light. And so Jesus picks up on that theme as well. 
And he spoke to them and he said, I'm the light of the world. Praise God for that. Because there's a lot of things and people who claim to be the light and are not the light. And it's important that we discern that. I'm the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. This is a constant theme. In fact, if we if we look in um, Isaiah uh, 42, I think it is. Let's look over there real quick, just just so you just get a little idea. This is these again. We're talking about we're talking about the the Bible is talking about two comings at the same time that a lot of people got really 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 confused. But the light to, and the redeemer that would come to save the world was 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 a theme in in the in betwixt all of that. And so Isaiah forty two six says, "I am Yahweh. I've called you in righteousness. He hasn't changed. I will also take hold of you by the hand and guard you, and I will give you a covenant to the people as a light to the nations to open blind eyes. Uh, light can do that, can it not? Then we look over." at um 42 let's see 49 6 and we pick up another uh theme about that where he says is it too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of jacob to cause the preserved ones of israel to return the exiles okay i will also give you as a light of the nations so that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth this is what god's doing in his first in the messiah's first coming this is what jesus is trying to tell the knuckleheads in the room that they don't get this is fun this is really fun um it's like watching a show that you know what's getting ready to happen but it keeps getting funnier every freaking time really it's it's sad but so anyway Jesus is saying you will have the proper light. He's the light of the world. He who follows him will, will not walk in, in darkness, but will have the light of life. You'll have the proper light to see with. The light that God created in the very beginning and said that was good. It was not just about creating the light that he said that. It was about that. We, he did create the light. But the light is something that is representative of himself, something that we're supposed to follow, that we're supposed to look to, as opposed to the darkness. There's a cosmic battle going on. The light is where we need to look to. And uh, so Jesus is talking about this light. Of course, it's associated with the torchlight ceremony of women during the festival, uh, the pillar of fire in the wilderness, all these symbolic things. And he's trying... To get them to see the correlation, maybe, so that the supposed theologians can uh, maybe learn a little something. So, Pharisee said to him, you're testifying about yourself. Your testimony is not true. Well, I mean, he is testifying about himself. And that's bad if he's not who he says he is. But if he is, then it's on you. This is ironically also now what the world says in droves. People who just want to see Jesus as a man, they're more than welcome to do that. This is a a free country, man. You can believe whatever you want to believe. At least you used to be able to, right, and say what you wanted to say. But there's a lot of reasons to believe that this man called Jesus is not only the most important figure that ever lived, and that's arguably the truth but that he was the one sent from God above to speak to you and to speak to me. And it's important that he's, that we listen to him. You know, C.S. Lewis said he's either a liar, which is basically what they just said to him. They said, your testimony's not true. Either he's a lunatic, he's, he's delusional, he thinks he's somebody he's not, thinks he's a poached egg, thinks he's the messiah whatever he's not or he's lord i think he's right i think those three are pretty good choices to decide which one you think jesus is and it's really important how we come down on the matters in verse 14 jesus said you know even if i testify myself that my testimony is true I, I for i know where i came from and where i'm going but you on the other hand do not know where i come from or where i am going <sighs> These guys are theologians without chest. They 
are talking about things that they have no clue about. And the next verse tells us exactly why. In verse 15, he says, You judge according to the flesh. I am not judging anyone. Now, this is public enemy number one, because the Bible very clearly, back in 1 Samuel 16, says that God looketh, sees not as man seeth. God looks on the heart. That's one thing. But this is public enemy number one, and this is religious leaders. So how do you think the parishioners are doing? If you see everything according to the flesh, if the person, the supposed theologian in the room is speaking off nonsense that you don't check to check to make sure it's coming from God himself, is it any one of the churches in a mess? Is it any wonder that a church full of people sit there and continue to watch somebody who admittedly is a philanderer and kind of is braggadocious and all these things and they just keep coming back? Why? What do they do? I can't understand that somebody needs to help me. Maybe somebody can in the comments tell me how this is possible. I mean, I know how it's possible because people are easily led, unfortunately, in that way, but I just it breaks my heart. Hopefully it breaks your heart as well. But he says, You judge according to the flesh. I'm not judging anyone. But even if I do judge, my judgment is true, for I am not alone in it, but I am the Father who sent me. Remember back in John 3, Jesus said, you didn't come to judge the world, to condemn the world. The world's going to be condemned by the words that he said, the deeds that he did, and the things that he manifested, and that he rose from the dead, and all these things in this record that he's laid out for us, and we didn't respond to it. It's not because he came this first time around to to slam the anvil down. It's really up to us. You can investigate. You can you can do your own body of research. You can ask God, the Holy Spirit, to come and speak to you in a very special way. He's not he's not beyond these things. He said, even if your law, even in your law, it's been written that the testimony of two men is true. And that's in Deuteronomy and a couple places, and certainly other places as well. And so he he leads into that and he says, I am he who testifies about myself and the father who sent me testifies about me. He says, so there's your two, big boy. Well, they don't think he came from the father, correct? John, of course, who also wrote 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, and Revelation. Man, I've been really thinking about getting into to Revelation. It's a scary prospect, but don't tempt me. I really, 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 really want to get into revelations first john 5 9 our boy john says if we receive the witness of men the witness of god is greater for the witness of god is that he has borne witness about his son john was there he was in the room with the theologian so he should know so we should pay attention to him and whether or not his testimony is true i submit to you it is it's really Jesus going back again and saying, you know, when he talks about you search the scriptures because in them you think you have eternal life. You know, they made they made the scriptures, they made them God as opposed to God himself. You search, you look and search the scriptures and pay attention. And if you did, you'll see, you'll understand that, that this is how it's supposed to go down. You need to get past the Torah and you need to get into the prophets where the prophets began to testify about what was going to happen but better yet you might want to understand that the Torah the first five books of the Old Testament spoke about me as well remember we went back to Moses we talked about all that y'all pay attention now take some copious notes I don't think anybody's got a pencil yeah <sighs> Verse 19, so they were saying to him, where is your father? Jesus answered, you know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. In other words, you would know that what I'm saying is straight from the father. Where have you been? Pay attention. But they will just simply say, and that's basically what they're saying, why is why this argumentation is going back and forth. They'll say the Father is not here to back you up, but they wouldn't know him if they saw him. Because again, their relationship is just with a book and their 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 theological system and their particularly their particular theological school. And they can't see anything outside of that. They don't think God is bigger than that. 
box. Uh, God being bigger than a box has been a problem for a long, long time. You know, some things just, you know, they just repeat themselves an awful lot. Something we might want to pay attention to. He said, verse 20, these words he spoke in the treasury. As he taught in the temple, he likes to hang out around the temple where those guys are so he can tick them off. Because his hour had not yet come. We're going to be getting into a time. We, we know it's here. It's upon us. But we're going to be getting into a segment very soon where his hour Indeed, John will say, had come. We're on the trek. We're on the path. Verse 21, then he said again to them, I go away, you'll seek me and you will die in your sins. Where I'm going, you cannot come. Um, Life is real and I don't think that's a place that we want to be. I don't think that's a place that they thought they were going to be, but he seems to be saying that they are hell bound. Because they're not receiving what he's saying. He came and suffered and died. And died and rose again. And left his record and his stamp for us to be able to find out. And believe. John wrote so that you and I might believe. So the Jews were saying surely he will not kill himself. Will he? Since he says where I'm going you cannot come. What in that? What's, what's up with these guys man? It's like as OBL. OBL. I have some people I call OBL. Oblivious. They're oblivious. What's up? What's up with that? I don't understand. Pay attention. He's in the room. The theologian is. Listen up. And he was saying to them you are from below and I am from above. You are not of this world you are of this world, but I am not of this world. Let's go to First John 4, 5. John, again, he says, They are from the world, therefore they speak as from the world, and the world hears them. You can tell somebody who's speaking from the world. There's going to be a stark contrast, the way they speak and the things that they do and the things that we as people of God are going to be about. It's going to be very clear. John 17, 14, 16. We're getting way ahead of ourselves. We're going to get there, you know, in a little while in our time together. John 14 says very clearly, John 17, 14, I have given them your word. This is Jesus speaking and the world has hated them. Why does the world hate you? Because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Everybody loves those guys who aren't the theologians in the room because they're of the world. So if everybody's going after somebody a little bit too much, that's the time that you just want to check and make sure there's authenticity there because that can often be the time that something's going to be revealed that you see is not there at all. Verse 16, they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. If you follow Jesus on the narrow path, your bent is towards not the world as opposed to the world. Doesn't mean you don't live in the world. Doesn't mean you have to. You don't have to do the things you need to do to make it in this world. Doesn't mean you get to don't get to enjoy some of the pleasures of the world. But when your focus is all on the world, 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 you're not going to be a follower of Christ. You're not going to be the theologian in the room guiding anybody in any path whatsoever. There's a stark contrast today as well between those who say they're of God. Have I said this too much already? But you know them by their fruit. Be fruit inspectors. You don't have to be little judges going around judging everybody. But you can walk around and you can look and say, hmm, ooh, hmm. facial expressions are good. You need to be discerning. You need to be aware. You know them by their fruit. Therefore, I said to you that you will die in your sins. Going back to what he said in verse 21. For unless you believe that I am he, and this is a message to all of us, you will die in your sins. People don't like to hear this uh, most inclusive exclusivity. This most inclusive exclusivity. Whosoever will may come. But unless you believe that I am he, that Jesus is the one that came to save the world and believe and embrace that, 
you're going to die like the rest of us, but you're going to die in your sins. Something tells me, based on what the Bible says, that dying in your sins, in other words, without repentance, without receiving the free gift, your grace is enough, and living into that, that it's not going to be a good place to be. I don't want to be in that place. Thank God I don't have to be. I repent daily of my sins because I'm a sinner, and so are you. John said he wrote that you might believe. I told you in the beginning that I'm teaching through this book because that you might believe. Jesus came that you might believe. He even came for these knuckleheads in the room, but they're not getting it. Don't be the knucklehead in the room. So they're saying to him, who are you? Jesus said to them, what I've been saying, what have I been saying to you from the beginning? Have you never heard your mom or your dad tell you? They tell you something, and you say, what did you say? You say, boy, are you serious? I've been telling you about this for weeks now, I've, or I've been telling you this all day, and you still haven't got it done. What is your problem? You need to clean out your ears, right? You need to listen. That's essentially what Jesus is saying to them. It's what I've been saying to you from the beginning. He's basically saying without the Spirit, which is what John's theme is, you can't see anything. You can't understand it if you're just looking at it from a from a theological only lens, meaning that you're looking at it just from your the, love, the Bible says, "Love your Lord, Lord your God, with all your mind, your soul, and your strength." Okay. It's not just we have so many Christians today that just love the Lord, or they say they do with their minds, but if that's as far as they go. You don't see much spirit in them. This is the problem with these boys. It's the proverbial deer in the headlights over and over and over again. It's the gift that keeps on giving, unfortunately. He said, I have many things to speak and to judge concerning you, but he who sent me is true, and the things which I heard from him, these I speak to the world. Same thing I'm saying to you, I'm saying to everybody else, is what he's saying. They did not realize he had been speaking to them about the Father. Verse 28, so Jesus said, When you lift up the Son of Man, he's predicting his death. Remember the serpent in the wilderness? Whenever they would look at the serpent, they they wouldn't die in the wilderness. It's kind of kind of weird, kind of odd, kind of weird symbol. Jesus used that twice. He used it in John. Three as well, like Moses. They want them to relate it back to Moses. You guys seem to be stuck on Moses. You can't seem to get past, you know, Deuteronomy. Okay. He said, so Jesus said, when you lift up the Son of Man on the cross, which is inevitably going to happen very soon, then you will know that I'm He, and I do nothing on my own initiative, but I speak the things the Father has taught me. And he who sent me is with me, has not left me alone. Would it be like Jesus, by the way? Here's why I say that, because his next line, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. Jesus left us an example. As Jesus walked, so ought we to walk. Do you do the things that are pleasing to the Father? That is our true North Star, the Spirit, and his love letter for us. And thank God there's at least a, a, a little bit of a good end to this story, just like what I've been saying over and over today to you. He says he spoke these things. Many came to believe in him, this time without the signs and the fanfare. They heard the words, and in their spirit, they knew it had to be true. Oh, gosh, I pray that for you today. This weekend as you go into it. That you reflect more about what you're doing for the for the weekend. And about where you stand with the one who came to give his life and speak life to us. And what have you done with it? And I guess I'll close also with this. You know, there's a lot of so-called theologians out there. We saw these knuckleheads. <sighs> It's important that you listen to the right one. 
the real theologian in the room has spoken, and that's what we talk about today. I pray that you will seek him with everything you have. Thank you for being with me today. I hope you have a great weekend. I don't know that we'll be back again this week, but we may. Uh, be sure as you as you get these videos just to hit subscribe, hit the like button and the little bell, and all these will come uh, to you. If you're on Rumble, just hit the follow button and hit like. These will come to you as well. God bless you. I love you, but most of all, Jesus loves you. Take care. Music